very happy to welcome our 10 minute, 15 minute speaker to the podium. Let's welcome Chris. You are from Prescott, right? Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name's Chris and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Hi everybody. Great to be here. Uh, <clears throat> My, I took my first drink at the age of 11, 1973, and I had my, first, my last drink in 2020, August 1st. Um, I didn't know what being an alcoholic was until I got to AA. Uh, but I can, I can look back and see that when I took my first drink, something happened to me. And from then on, for many years, all I could think about was getting the next one. And at first it was fun, and it, it gave me a sense of relief from the, uh, the confusion that I felt uh, as a young person. I was uh, the last of four children. I was born and raised in Arizona. Um, I was a little later than my three siblings. My folks were 32 and 30 when I was born, so they were well on their way with their careers and their social life, and they didn't... Um, I don't think they were that interested in raising another child, so I, I was, uh, um, <clears throat> I didn't get a lot of parental supervision, and I didn't get a lot of love and encouragement, I, I, it's the way I felt. I'm certain that my parents loved me, um, they provided a great place for me to live and a stable home, but uh, there was something missing from my life, and I, I was looking for that. Um, and. Uh, I want to give you a little idea about um, my relationship with my family. We weren't very close. Um, still, we aren't very close, and it's, it, I feel that's unfortunate. But I have my AA family, and they give me the support and the love that I, I missed as a child and a young man. My father was a hard worker. He was uh, very determined to be successful, and my mom was... Um, very determined to be a debutante of sorts. I think that's how I would describe her. She, she's still alive, she's 91 years old, and um, still haven't, hasn't uh, come to terms with the fact that she suffers from the family disease of alcoholism, I think. I, I've never, she won't admit that, but. <clears throat> so, the, um, when I when I drank, um, I drank to get drunk, and um, that's the feeling I, I wanted. Um, I, I can remember times like waking up in the morning and looking out the window to see if my truck was in the yard. Um, those were the, the fun days. I had a lot of fun. I grew up in around the Scottsdale Tempe area, so there was lots of things to do for young people. When I turned 19, that was the drinking age in Arizona. And the first night, I went to a club that played live music and uh, drank myself silly. The, uh, I fell in love with that because it was uh, live music, alcohol, and girls. And, and so that's the way I wanted to live my life. I uh, decided I would learn how to play the guitar and become a musician in a bar and that's how I was going to get all those three things that I, I loved. <clears throat> I can tell you that that's not a very lucrative uh, occupation. <laughs> so, um, I was a daily drinker my entire life, mostly in the beginning it was beer until beer wasn't really enough and in my late 30s I decided that um, I could drink a little whiskey and then beer and then in my 40s, it was uh, basically just whiskey. And then in my 50s, um, it turned out that uh, cheap vodka was the best way to go. It was cost effective and it uh, got me where I needed to be quickly. So as, as, the, um, as my alcohol and pro alcoholism progressed, I started to feel the effects on my health, and my family life, my, my uh, r relationships with people, work, um, my wife, my kids, 
Um, and and I, I was uh, one of those people with, that had uh, really bad shakes and I would vomit every morning. I couldn't eat in the morning until I had some cheap vodka to settle my stomach. That was how the last few years looked. <clears throat> I, uh, I desperately, I was so miserable, I, I just desperately wanted to quit. And every morning I, I wondered, why, why do I keep doing this to myself? And I would be the first one at the liquor store. It's, it's a, the Lloyd's Liquors in Prescott is just down the hill from me. And so I could be there in about 15 minutes on my bicycle because at the end of the of my drinking I, I was at least smart enough not to drive so I would ride my bicycle down there in the morning because I was usually out and I would be their first customer and I was that old guy that with shaky hands counted up enough change to get cheap vodka and sometimes I would have to return that afternoon but uh, I was miserable and I remember looking in the mirror and looking into my eyes and and just not seeing anything. It was like it was empty. I was my soul was completely gone and I I didn't know what to do. I really was lost. Um and uh it started to lose a lot of time. The last 2 years I had a lot of blackout time. My wife uh when I met my wife uh, 33 years ago and, and married her, I was a drinker then, and and um, we raised two boys together, and she seen me at my best and at my worst. And at the end, I really didn't have a social group at all. I it was a uh, work from home. I take care of a, a little bit of acreage outside of Prescott with horses and chickens and. And uh, so I was left to myself all the time, and my wife would work in town and come home, and um, usually she had to uh, roust me off the couch and help me to bed. But uh, it finally got to the point where she set the ultimatum, and, and uh, I was really puzzled. I didn't know what to do. I, I had no experience with, with recovery of any sort, so I didn't know that there was a, an alternative to being uh, an alcoholic. So I made the decision to uh, check myself into a detox center. I, I knew that it would be ugly trying to uh, detox. So that was, that was the plan. And I really, beyond that, I had no plan at all. So I checked myself into a detox center February 10th, uh, 2020. And uh, I was there until the 14th. Well, while I was there, the, uh, there was a physician on staff, and every day he would see me um, and ask me how I was doing. And, and uh, I think towards the end, when I, my head started to clear a little bit, I started to pick up on a few things. But I remember, the, I think it was the second to the last day I was there, he, he had me hold my hands out, and he said, you're going to stay one more night. And I was brokenhearted. I, I was just really wanted to go home. That place was... It was, um, there were no windows. You had to uh, get staff to help to unlock the bathroom door to go to the bathroom. It was really, there was no privacy. I couldn't look outside and I'm outside all the time. So I felt very claustrophobic in there, but it was, it was a safe place to, you know, the, the reason I was there was to, to get some help. But I remember the doctor asking me, what are you going to do when you get out? And I said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, what sort of follow-up care do you have planned? And I said, I, I don't know. What do you suggest? And he said, I think you need a long-term program. And I, I just said, nope, not going to happen. And he said, what about AA? And I, I said, I guess, yeah, I can do that. And uh, he said, this is one thing I remember what he told me. He said, go to AA and get a sponsor right away and get somebody with double digits. And I had to ask him what that meant, what's double digits? And he said, a guy that's got 10 years or more sobriety. And I said, okay. <clears throat> and I got out on February 14th, 2020. And my wife picked me up and I said, I, there's I, two things that we need to do before we go home. I, want, I, I gotta have some Mexican food and I wanna go by Intergroup and buy a big book. I'd never seen the big book before, and when I bought it, I was like, wow, I don't, 
know if I can do this. I'm not a reader. But I remember thumbing through it, and I found a couple of things, but I still had no plan. I was not going to walk into, find or walk into an AA meeting by myself. It's just not, that's not in my nature. I was too afraid. Um, it's something I would, I mean, when I have, when there's something that I'm good at, I have a lot of confidence when I'm, when I, when it's something uh, different, I'm, I'm very scared. And so I thought, well, I, you know, I'll wait till my wife has a day off and maybe we'll find something and she can hold my hand and take me to an AA meeting. February 15th in the morning, I was out in the yard and my landlady came out and walked up to me and she said, I'm going to send you a phone number of a friend of mine. I want you to call this number. And I said, right now? And she said, yes. And um, it, it was a man that she, I had met there once before. So I called this guy and he, he was all excited and happy and there was nothing to be happy about in my life right then. He was kind of annoying, he was so happy. <clears throat> but he was glad to hear from me, you know. And uh, he said, hey, it's Matt, I'm here and I'm visiting for a week and I want to go to some AA meetings. Would you like to go with me? And I said, yeah, I do, uh, but I can't drive. And he said, oh, don't worry about it, I'll come get you. So he found a meeting, um, it's a place called Safe Harbor in Prescott. It's a meeting place. It's not as nice as this, actually. I love you guys' clubhouse. Anyway, he came and he picked me up, and on the whole way there, the drive is about 20 minutes or so from my house, and he talked nonstop. And that's the guy, he, that's Matt. He just like he loves to talk, but he's schooling me, right? Giving me the lowdown on what I might expect. And uh, I tried to be... Uh, a, a, a pleasant guest, but he was annoying the hell out of me. <laughs> <clears throat> so we get to this clubhouse, and I get out of the truck, and there's this guy dressed like this, right, in, in a suit. And uh, he shakes my hand, and he said, hi, I'm Pat. And I'm like, what is this, man? <laughs> and so we go into this meeting. It's downstairs at this club. It's in a kind of a small room, and it's cozy call it cozy it's kind of dank but um that was a, it was called the one two three meeting and so that's focused on the first three steps and it's 15 minute speaker and then um some discussion and when the, uh i was um i i, I was um uh, trying to find the word i was so f interested in what this speaker had uh, it was it was amazing to me. It was the first time in my life that some I heard somebody say w what I felt, and I couldn't I didn't have the communication skills to express that at that time, but I heard something that day that um, got me thinking that this is this might be where I belong, and I uh, just really felt safe, I guess. And so they open up the floor. They start out anybody with like zero to 30 days want to speak. And I had just gotten out of detox the day before. So I'm like, yeah, I just got out of detox. And I didn't have much to say. I don't remember what I said. I didn't know anything about recovery. But I said, yeah, I just got out of detox yesterday. And they're all smiling and getting <laughs> writing their phone numbers down, right? And uh, so that was the beginning, and, and uh, the, the next day, my friend comes and gets me, and he takes me back to the same clubhouse, and this time it's the Sunday morning men's stag meeting. It's a big meeting. I think at that time there was probably 60, 60 guys in there, maybe, something like that. Now it's over 100 every Sunday, but... Um, so I, I pick a spot, and I'm, you know, new, I'm new, so I'm back in the back. And uh, this guy that I had met the day before, he walks in and he's like happy to see me. And he's like, hey, I want you to meet a friend of mine. And I stand up to shake this dude's hand and we look at each other and go, holy shit, I know this guy. And uh, I said, hey, how long you been doing this? And he said, 30, 
five, I think 35 years now. And I said, will you be my sponsor? And he handed me his phone number and I didn't call him for three days. Wow. So I, I finally felt like my motives for recovery in the beginning were somewhat sinister, but I was, um, I, I was like, I got to call this guy because I said I would, you know, that, so motivation is motivation, whatever it takes, right? So anyway, <clears throat> I didn't know that you could go to AA and just hang around and not do anything, but unfortunately, I picked a sponsor that is very active, even at, I think he just celebrated 38 years, and um, he, he's very active, he's a super great guy, I'll, I'll get back to uh, how I knew him, okay, so in Prescott, my mom and dad grew up in Prescott and went to high school there, my mom's mother and dad owned a little bar and grill uh, on Gurley Street. And it was very popular with the locals and they sold steaks and hamburgers and Coors and Bud. And so uh, there was a lot of Bud and Coors consumed there. And my sponsor, my, my one and only AA sponsor, drank a lot of Coors beer in that place. And he dated my sister, one of my older sisters. So that's how I knew the guy. I knew him from the 70s. And we drank together later. I've done, um, I won't tell you what all we did together, but I lost touch with him for many years. And uh, now he's my sponsor. So, you know, the miracles of this program for me started early. And um, he, uh, I, I did not get sober right away. I had some slips. I could get 90 days and then I just had to drink again until I did enough of the work where one day I just didn't want to drink anymore. And so my, my current sobriety date is August 1st, 2020. Yeah, so I just celebrated three years and I'm, I feel great. It's, it's amazing. But um, I fell in with a group of people that are very active and very big book driven. They're not thumpers and they're not um, re reformers. They're just all about participating in the program and fellowship. And um, I, I, I do book studies and I do, uh, I do some service work uh, and, and, you know, all those things. It, some days I don't want to do them, but uh, one great thing about having a service commitment is that you can't talk yourself out and not going. And uh, trust me, I, I still do. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know. I have my doubts sometimes. Why am I still, you know, why do I do this? But I get reminders constantly that if I don't continue to do the things that kept me sober in the beginning, and continue to keep me sober now. I, I try to stay with the basics and um, I see examples all around me, people that um, I look up to that are still active after decades of sobriety. I aspire to be like those people and, and to live a, a, a good, happy, useful life. And um, the, uh, the gifts that I've gotten from uh, living by spiritual principles as best I can. I'm still human and I'm also a man and, and you know how we are, but uh, the, the, the gifts are, I'll, I'll tell you what the, the, the biggest thing, and it's still, I have to remind myself sometimes that the, the first thing that happened to me was the the voices that I had, the, 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 the uh, intrusive thoughts, the, the noise in my head, it, 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 I was able to get a hold of that and control it. And the serenity, that's the gift that I, I will treasure and, and work for and continue to work for. That, that's the biggest thing that uh, the freedom that I have, being able to get in my truck and drive somewhere and, and, and enjoy the you know, the freedom that America offers us, I can do that whenever I want, wherever I go. I haven't been followed by a cop in over three years. It's amazing. You know? <laughs> I was always looking over my shoulder, man, because I, you know, I probably shouldn't have been behind the wheel for uh, quite a bit of my adult life. But um, 
Anyway, I, I uh, really appreciate this opportunity to come up here and enjoy meeting with you guys. Thank you so much.